June 1940, Hitler's troops had pushed through Europe, Austria, Poland, Belgium had fallen, and the United Kingdom was in his sights. Now Adolf Hitler stood just as Napoleon had stood more than a hundred years before and looked across the English Channel to the one fighting obstacle that stood between him and world domination. Hitler was convinced he was about to win the Second World War, but someone was about to get in his way. At London's northern edge sits Bentley Priory, a stately home with some serious tales to tell. Bentley Priory has had a number of incarnations, a friary, a destination for London socialites, even a girls' school. But it was as headquarters for fighter command during the Battle of Britain that it really made its mark. At the height of the Second World War, Bentley Priory was a hive of secret work, the nerve centre of RAF operations. In charge was Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding. Nearing retirement, he was a man with a wealth of operational experience and a reputation. Opinionated and headstrong, Dowding ruffled feathers, but his handle on the latest technologies put him ahead of the game, and he thought differently. With planes being sent across the Channel to assist the fight in France on the 16th of May 1940, Dowding wrote to Winston Churchill with a warning. I would remind the Air Council, he wrote, that the last estimate which they made as to the force necessary to defend this country was 52 squadrons, and my strength has now been reduced to the equivalent of 36 squadrons. If the Home Defence Force is drained away in desperate attempts to remedy the situation in France, defeat in France will involve the final, complete and irremediable defeat of this country. Winston Churchill listened. Dowding could keep hold of his remaining planes and pilots, allowing him to turn his attention to keeping control of the skies. Here comes the Luftwaffe. In dozens of flights, hundreds of planes. With the Luftwaffe far outnumbering the RAF, knowing in advance when they were set to attack Britain was imperative for survival. And there was a system Dowding knew could help. Radar. Radar technology wasn't new, but when scientists realised they could use it to detect incoming German bombers, it was a bit of a light bulb moment. And so the government invested, building a network of these giant masts around the country. Located at prime points along Britain's coastline, looming steel transmitter towers and wooden receiver towers were erected, looking out across the channel. Working together, they formed the first early warning radar network in the world, that became known as Chain Home. All four of the 360-foot masts that stood at Bordsey in Suffolk have now been dismantled, but their importance remains. This is the site of the first operational radar station in the world. The Germans had no idea. They sent an airship uh, during August 1939 to try and discover what was happening. And for all sorts of reasons, they reached entirely the wrong conclusions. So at the beginning of the war, they thought we were trying to detect the radio transmissions from their aircraft to hear what they were saying, rather than detect the aircraft and where they were. It was important because the Germans significantly outnumbered us by about four aircraft to one, and we couldn't afford for our Spitfires and Hurricanes to be constantly in the air patrolling and looking for the German attackers. We had to be, be able to vector in the aircraft to the right place at the right time. When the radar signals bounced off incoming aircraft, a blip would show in the waveform. Operators were trained to work out how far away they were and in what direction they could be found. Many of them members of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. There's a long sort of swiveling, I suppose it was a ruler, Mm. for range. It's all very primitive. Mm. Sometimes it was 20 or 30 plots a minute and I don't know how we did it. At the beginning of the, of the uh, chase on the, on the CRT there was mm. always a, a lot of muddle and that was caused by buildings you see. I did two or three sites in Plymouth and they were all um, outside Plymouth itself. 
Mm. In lovely places, actually. <laughs> we were sitting in front of a television screen, and we had a headset on and a mouthpiece, and we were connected the whole time to plotters mm. who were in the um, headquarters of Fighter Command. And uh, we, our job was to tell them what we could see on the screen, which in uh, other words, what was in the sky in front of us. You could get up to 300 bombers at once. And uh, you had to give an, when you got a, a big blip like that, you had to give an estimate of how many planes you thought was in there. It was quite a responsibility. Back at Bentley Priory, Sir Hugh Dowding believed that information could give British pilots the edge and had organised his staff to make sense of it. Radar operators across the country would telephone their plots to Bentley Priory, where men and women were waiting to receive it in what became known as the filter room. That data, along with sightings from ground spotters, was triangulated to establish the areas most at risk. The information was then pushed through to the ops room, located in a separate bunker, where staff built a map of what was happening around the UK, updated at five-minute intervals. The picture was constantly moving, with the men and women in these rooms updating the maps and charts any time any new information came through. That urgency was vital, not just to protect civilians, but to get pilots into the air at the right time too. A quick flash from the control station to the fighter station. It enabled Dowding to move his planes into a dominant position, intercepting incoming Luftwaffe and foiling Hitler's attempts to take control of the skies. The pilots who flew those Spitfires and Hurricanes, known as the Few, are remembered in Bentley Priory's rotunda, along with the men from Commonwealth nations who joined Britain in the fight. This is, um, as it says here, Adolf Gisbert Milan known as Sailor because previous to his uh, RAF service he'd served in the Merchant Marine. So he was much older than the average Battle of Britain pilot. But Milan was South African. He was quite famous, not least because he was an outstanding pilot. He was an outstanding shot. He coalesced all of his thoughts on air fighting into what became quite famous. It was passed around the Royal Air Force. Ten of my rules for air fighting. And that, that got a lot of circulation in the Air Force. And he managed to distill it all down. Obviously, there's, you could write a book about air fighting. But it shows you to be able to just produce and distill it down is, is, is in itself a skill. And that's what he did. He, he said, right, these are the th have these in your mind. Are there any that you read and you think, yeah, that's definitely relevant for now? Do you know what there are? Initiative, aggression air discipline and teamwork are words that mean something in air fighting. Sure do, even today. Fifteen Commonwealth nations took part in the Battle of Britain and the Polish pilots, based at RAF Northolt with 303 Squadron, made a particular impression. And of course the Poles, who had seen their country overrun, had a fire in their bellies like no others. They were, you know, they really were very aggressive. Go back to those rules, aggression, yeah. I mean, you have to have it, but they were skillful, incredibly skillful. It took a bit of time for the Royal Air Force to really capture how valuable they were going to be. And it took a bit of time um, to accept them. But in the time in the battle, 303 Squadron became the top scoring squadron and they were known for their aggression and also their skill. The work of the many radar operators, the few pilots and Hugh Dowding's system meant the war was not lost. But despite his success, with Hitler changing tactics to move towards bombing towns and cities in the Blitz, Hugh Dowding's name was almost written out of the history books. The Air Ministry wrote a history of the Battle of Britain in 1947. Dowding's name wasn't mentioned. Churchill was furious and, and really did have at the um, air ministry about this. I think he said something to the, to the likes of, um, would have, it was a little bit like somebody writing about Trafalgar and not mentioning, mentioning Lord Nelson.
And that really captures it exactly. The Battle of Britain, in terms of the single person who was so influential, was Dowding. Yes, the young pilots and, and, and the air crew were the gallant spear point, but it was his system that they were running. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel with notifications switched on.